Here comes another Medical Mondays. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to another Medical Monday. Tonight, we're going to talk about the heart topic, one of the plagues that we've talked about before that is plaguing the world today, diabetes. The statistics are staggering. We've seen diabetes in ages that we should not even be seeing them. So um, this is a subject that we'll be talking about every now and then that we'll be bringing back every now and then. I am Toyin Okwesomi, a family practitioner, HIV specialist, and I treat addictions in Maryland. I'm introducing to you tonight a special guest our very own Dr. Aluya, who happens to also be the president of Nigerian American Public Affairs Committee, NAPAC, in the United States. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Nelson Aluya. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Christian. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and to be uh, a guest today. And like you said, uh, um, I'm also the president of NEPAC. Uh, NEPAC is the Nigerian American Public Affairs Committee, uh, which is a political platform uh, that does uh, encourage young individuals to get into politics and policies. Uh, well, but your minds, brand minds with the capacity and the trust to lead. Um, and we also engage in the area of healthcare, uh, advocacy, um, youth empowerment, uh, women, uh, entrepreneurship, and a host of other things uh, that we do here in the United States. So um, that's uh, my other vocational stuff that I do. Um, I call myself a medical advocate. I, also uh, pursue other uh, adventure in the sense of uh, healthcare um, analysis, um, teaching and, and the whole stuff of all that like that. So uh, I'm also a professor of medicine, uh, medicine and pediatric strain. So I'm uh, a physician and a pediatrician at the same time. And uh, I was the president of the uh, New Jersey Medical um, Association, uh, the first non-American born to be president in the state of New Jersey. I was also the immediate past president of uh, AMPA, which is the Nigerian the Association of Physicians here in the United States uh, in the New Jersey chapter. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, I'm glad to be talking about this uh, plague that's with all of us as you see it. Thank you. Thank you so much and uh, welcome. Welcome to our platform. Thank you. So I'm going to yield back to you to educate us. Right. Um, I mean, diabetes, I've written about diabetes, I've talked about diabetes all across the globe. Uh, and it's a huge interest uh, of mine. Another one is also sickle cell. Uh, nevertheless, uh, diabetes is what I call the, the pandemic before the pandemic. As a matter of fact, it's actually a walking pandemic. It says that um, it's no longer just a disease that occurs in you know, certain areas of Western world anymore. It's across the globe. And uh, we begin to really see its devastating effects all over the world. Um, today, we have about 425 million people with diabetes across the globe. And here in the United States, about 30 million. And of which uh, about 888, no, 89 million are pre-diabetic. 
Uh, what does that mean? Uh, those are terms you begin to hear subsequently. Um, there are individuals who uh, are the verge of becoming diabetic, uh, but they're not there yet, uh, in the sense that you have uh, values and, and um, parameters you use in measuring what diabetes is, and um, they're just at the verge of it. And you know, in the next, you know, three to four years, uh, forty percent of them will become diabetic. So, uh, in two thousand sixteen, the WHO and CDC um, actually declared this. Um, an epidemic, but that's 2016. From 2016 to now, uh, those numbers have you know, skyrocketed so badly to the point where it is uh, a healthcare, um, a public healthcare um, uh, event. Now, um, what diabetes? Diabetes is a disease, uh, usually a chronic medical disease that affects every tissue in the body because every tissue uh, must eat. And for them to eat, they depend on glucose. And that's the, the fuel for the body to, to function from the brain uh, to the tissues in the feet or even the nail bed. So they all depend on uh, glucose to, to survive and, and grow. And um, so the diabetes is when you have too much sugar running around the bloodstream to a point where uh, the effect of the sugar running around uh, too many of, too much of it uh, begins to affect um, the tissues all over the body. And like I said, it can affect from the brain uh, down to the feet. We're gonna talk about the signs and symptoms uh, subsequently. Now, um, diabetes is controlled uh, by the pancreas that produces insulin. So if the insulin is out there, it helps the body to absorb the sugar or every kind of food that you eat that goes to the liver to get broken down. Uh, the pancreas is a small organ right, you know, on the upper left side of uh, the stomach, right above the, uh, right above the spleen, uh, on the left side, well, not on the right, the liver is on the right side. So uh, if it's defective, meaning it, it either cannot produce or even when it produces, then it's, there's what they call insulin resistance, meaning the insulin is not getting into tissue. Uh, there are a couple of reasons that cause insulin not to get into the tissue. So for the individuals like that, yes, you begin to see them have um, excessive sugar in the whole system. Now, um, there are two types, main two types of diabetes, uh, the type one, uh, which is the total failure of the pancreas, meaning the pancreas is no longer working. It's going to a point where it's almost dead. Uh, like every other organ, they go through process where they can die. Um, but then the other one is the type two, which is the one where uh, the pancreas is working, producing a whole lot of insulin, but the insulin is not getting into the tissue. Now, there are other sub um, units of uh, sub description of uh, diabetes as well. There's uh, um, diabetes that will cause in pregnancy. Uh, and then there's uh, a, one called diabetes type one and a half. Uh, a lot of people don't know about this, uh, but there are different nomenclatures that come up uh, over time. There used to be called uh, MODI, uh, onset diabetes of the young, meaning when you have individuals with diabetes uh, who are young, but then they come down with you know, signs and symptoms of diabetes, but it's usually due to obesity. But that nomenclature has been, you know, uh, discarded. And there's what you have, like one and a half, which is LADA, latent autoimmune disease of the adult. Now, coming back to the first nomenclature, uh, which is the type one, now where the organ completely fails. In that case, the organ is not producing insulin at all. The pancreas is not producing insulin. So uh, it is not producing insulin. So it therefore means that every food that the individual eats it's just gonna go after being broken down into glucose in the system, which just circulate around the system. And in the body trying to utilize the sugar, uh, it can't. So it finds other means um, to um, make use or produce fuel. And the process of producing fuel, uh, the byproducts that ideally should not uh, come up. And those byproducts, for example, ketones, 
And that's why for those who are diabetic, we hear them talk about ketones. So if those ketones continue to, to go on, uh, they accumulate and then, you know, of course, go to the brain and, you know, cause uh, uh, debilitating effect. There are other con components as well, uh, butyric acid and uh, acetone and all the other things that produce, those are toxic. They're toxic to the brain, toxic to the eye, toxic to the kidneys. And then, um, and those are the issues that happen. Now with a type two, where the individual uh, is producing insulin, the pancreas is working, but unfortunately uh, it would not go, the, um, the insulin would not go into a tissue. Now for the first one, which is the type one, um, those individuals, the reason why it, 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 the pancreas can fail, one, it could be um, autoimmune disease in the sense that uh, uh, they're in, uh, viruses that attack the pancreas that shuts it down. It does happen. And usually it happens during the end of fall. And that's why in fall, you see more individuals come up with diabetes uh, than usual. And usually very common in young children, um, young as 15 months, as a matter of fact, where the pancreas fails. Um, some people, for some reason, just genetically programmed. Uh, I know of a family, a few families actually, where the girls in that family, once they get to age 16, boom, there's a turn off, the pancreas just shuts down. Everybody knows, and everybody who's a girl in that family knows that. So they, they, brace, they, 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 they embrace it and they brace for it once they turn 16. But the boys in that family don't have any problems like that. So that's the reason why it can happen. Now for the type two, but insulin does not go into the system. Uh, those individuals uh, can also be autoimmune disease as well, or uh, just because you know there's some inflammatory process going on in the whole body. And as well as uh, maybe for those who are really obese, uh, it does happen. But unfortunately, we begin to see that um, individuals who have, um, who are thin, um, don't necessarily have to be obese anymore to have diabetes. And these are the, the, the whole dynamics of what we're seeing uh, as it is right now. Now, of course, individuals who are pregnant, um, pregnancy is a very dynamic, um, process in the sense that there's an increased weight, there's an increased metabolism, there's an increased fluid, there's an increased uh, outpour of hormones. Uh, a lot of those hormones are steroid hormones as well. Uh, just to get the body and the baby get ready for the future and uh, growth and development. So the whole conundrum of everything else, including uh, the outpour and increases the, re the resistance of um, the insulin um, into the, the, the body. And as well, you have circulating um, autoantibodies as well, as well as circulating um, uh, big products, the ligands that binds to insulin and insulin-like products. So you don't have enough of itself, again, into those tissues. And that's why individuals who are pregnant, not all of them, but if you have a propensity as a family history, yes, it can happen. Now for those, usually when the baby is born, um, the, everything reverses back as you lose weight and the whole um, body you know, readjusts by itself. But individuals who uh, have pregnancy-induced um, diabetes or hyperglycemic state have a 30% chance of becoming diabetic in their lifetime. Now to the last one we talked about, which is LADA, uh, the one I call the type one and a half. That's what we tend to call it because the type one, type two, and type one and a half in between and type 1 and, and type 2. Why do they call that? Because usually they begin like a type, um, like they begin like a type 1. Um, uh, no, they begin like a type 2, actually. So that um, there's an increased resistance in the pancreas uh, within the tissue in producing the amount of insulin that it produces. But even when you produce that amount of insulin, the ones that actually go into the body gets really, uh, reduced cost of circulating antibodies. And that's why it's called latent autoimmune diabetes of the young. So they're usually young and uh, accumulate well enough, they begin to attack the pancreas itself and the pancreas completely shut down. So they produce like type one, meaning uh, you could give them medication, uh, type two, you can give them medication, metformin and all that, and they'll be doing well. But as you go on, you find out that you're increasing the dose of the medication you give them, you're adding more medication and adding more medication to the point where that they now require insulin. 
and the point where you require insulin to the point where the insulin, the tablets no longer work, they are fully on insulin. So they begin like a type two and they eventually end up like a type one. And they're usually young as well. So these are the things that we begin to see. Now, um, in, in terms of public health, uh, we begin to see that here in the United States, they've done an extensive amount of work. And some of the individuals who have did that were also Nigerians as well. There's a professor, Dagogo Jack. Uh, it's one individual, as you all need to know, uh, look him up. Uh, he's done, he actually re <laughs> recently wrote a book uh, on pre-diabetic state and what's happening. So a lot of the studies that we see what's happening across the globe, he's done a whole lot of work as well uh, in that field. So um, if you look at the story of what diabetes is in the country, there's a mirror image of diabetes and obesity. They were perfectly mirror image. So, and that actually began way back in the 1970s, uh, early and peaked up to uh, the late 1990s, and then began to plateau uh, in the mid 2000s. Now, when the obesity plateaued, meaning they increased awareness of, of uh, obesity and the related medical issues that uh, and people begin to put so much effort on it and emphasis and you know a um, whole lot of diets and everything came out. Obesity actually plateaued. And then of course the government get, got behind it in the sense that you know the increased amount of uh, taxes on soda uh, or carbonated drinks and a whole lot of other things that they did. So it did plateau. But unfortunately obesity did not plateau. So we begin to ask ourselves why? You know, and and um, again, diabetes is one disease that uh, I, I often joke and I tell people it's going to change our DNA, uh, in the sense that uh, the whole lot of things are happening. And you know, giving you a perspective, uh, global outlook, because I actually do a presentation on diabetes, where I call it the beta um, diabetes, the beta global experience. Uh, like I said, it was first described as an epidemic in 2016. That um, from China to India to uh, Saudi Arabia and tend to Africa for those of us who are of African descent. Diabetes in Africa. Africa was actually first described as a continent without diabetes. And why? In the 1980s, there were just about 800,000 people with diabetes in the country, uh, in the continent. And, um, and most people just thought maybe because of our food and the way our lifestyle, our people lived outside and in the field worked. And um, of course, the sunlight that we have as well, we, we don't understand how much of these things begin to really affect us uh, as, we go on, as we go on. And, and we know that um, for those who get a whole lot of vitamin D from the sun, uh, the actually, um, uh, it's, it's an immune modulator and the point of sense that it upregulates your immune system to when where it dampens the, the upsurge of any immune response that the body gets from somewhere else. So all those autoimmune diseases that tend to happen are downregulated when you have a high vitamin D level. And that's what, you know, what's happening in, in most tropical countries, or especially like in Africa. Um, but as we speak today, from 1980 to now, uh, I'll give you a little perspective. In 2015, there were just about 17,000, uh, 17 million people from 800,000, we went up to 17 million in 2015. Today is about 20 to 21 million people with diabetes in Africa. And we know that that's grossly uh, underestimated. Where in this country, we have about 30 uh, million people with diabetes right now and pre-diabetes about 88 or 89 million people. So, but again, the question of managing diabetes in Africa is still so far-fetched. Um, a lot of us back home still don't understand or recognize the disease or recognize the signs and symptoms of the disease because it's new to us. As Marava is actually new to our DNA, it's new to the black DNA. But when you come across to, you know, the continent to the United States, um, it's not as new because the environmental changes and the temporary area and all that and the absence of the sun in areas where, um, you know, in the temporary areas tend to 
increase the risk of autoimmune disease. And of course, we begin to see all the things we're seeing. Now, anthropologically, and I always say this, that the reason why here in the United States, you find that the effects of diabetes is far more on African-Americans here is because if you look back in, in, in our history or human history, life, as you all know, started in Africa. Now, it took those people who are here, I mean, the Caucasians, the, everybody else, they left Africa over 50 to 60 million years ago. You know, 60, 50 to 60,000 years ago. And all that process of evolution has made them adapt to the changes that are here. And those, you see, are those who survived out of it. So those of us who came 500 years ago from slavery and everything else, we're seeing life, the whole process for those who left Africa over 60,000 years ago. And that's what we're talking about here in America. It is so much worse. And the attendant medical complications that come with it, strokes, kidney failure, everything else in this country is so much more in us because it's, our, it's new to our DNA. Now, signs and symptoms, of course, like I said, it affects the brain down to the feet. Um, very early, a few people will tend to have burning sensation in their legs, meaning um, you have things, it feels like the ants or needles in your legs or ants crawling up your legs. Those are very early signs of symptoms, especially if it's, if it's on both legs. Those are very early signs of symptoms. And again, for those who you find that all of a sudden you're waking up to pee, three, four, five times at night. Now, if you're a female, well, you, I don't know if there's a UTI, meaning there's burning or no burning. If there's no burning, are you waking up multiple times at night and you're having to need to drink a lot of water, then you need to get a check, your sugar check. Now, for a male, if it happens the same thing, questions I used to ask, do you have to wait for the urine to come out? If it doesn't, do you feel you've had an empty, complete void in? If that's not it, and of course, if you're younger or you're not the age group where you have a prostate enlargement, then again, irrespective, you should get your sugar checked. And um, for the individuals, all of a sudden, you find out that you can't read. You know, you have visual problems, blurring of vision and all that. It's not just old age, get your sugar checked as well. You know, so, and, and for men, you know, all of a sudden you have problem with uh, erectile dysfunction. Uh, those are early signs and symptoms as well. Uh, from, from diabetes. So um, as it goes on, a few, everybody presents differently. And I always ask uh, patients of mine um, in the family, what are the complications that individuals in your family have? Because whatever they have is what most likely you will have. If it's kidney, then most likely that's what you're going to get. If it's stroke, that's what you're going to get because it runs with your DNA. You know, so um, again, those are early symptoms. And that's why there's micro, what are called micro, small vessel, the small vessel complications of that. Complications of that. And those very tiny vessels, for instance, need um, Dr. Luya, you are breaking off. Oh, oh. In and out, yeah. Oh, I don't want to use I, I, or something. Maybe it's my Zoom. Sorry. Okay. So maybe I can I get closer a little bit. Or oh, it's just the, the internet here. Can you guys hear yeah, me? Yeah, you better you now. You better now. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. So um for individuals who uh, like I said, those microvascular complications, they start very early. Those tiny, tiny vessels um compromise. For instance, the vessels are compromised. For instance, the nerve themselves, the nerve need to eat. So the, the, the vessel that go to the nerves are compromised. The nerves are packed out. It's the burning sensation that you get, those cross sensations that you get, that's how those are signs and symptoms. Now, for those who have to wake up multiple times to pee, because I always tell you, if you put water, and sugar on the table. If you look at it, if you put your finger on either one of them, the one with the sugar is stickier. So that sticky feeling as it passes through the kidney pulls water out. It pulls water out of the individual and that's why they pee more. So those are the reasons, you know, elemental reasons why, you know, the Now for the eye, those 
intensity field that you get goes into the fluid because we have in the front and the back of the eye. We have, if the water, that's, that, that sugar gets into this area, it produces what they call a different kind of sugar called inositol. I think it's the reflect, reflective capacity of the of the of the of the lenses and even the globe itself. So that passes in microvascular. And of course, for men, you know, the blood vessels to the to the penis. Uh, when they are compromised, they have erectile dysfunction. Vessel defects. That's when individuals get strokes or they have a heart attack. Or heart. But of course, if you have a of legs, you have wounds that are difficult to is it that evil that the wounds like before those wounds that change what time they get be compromised to the point that the individual can hit his leg. Uh, 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 a, a piece uh, of furniture. You're really uh, breaking off again, Dr. Aluya. Oh, wow. Sorry. It's very, it's very, uh, <laughs> it's really bad. Maybe it's been tough. I don't know. Um, I wonder, is it better now? Yeah, you have your earpiece in. Yeah, it's my earpiece. I don't know if it's my earpiece, but I think it's a uh, reception here. Is it, can you hear me better? Um. Can somebody else mute and uh, comment if they can hear Dr. Aluya better? Uh, are you yeah. on the phone or you're on the, on the direct internet in the office? No, I'm in the office and I was using the cell phone because where I was, I had to come out somewhere else so I could get uh, better internet. For some reason, I don't know, the reception just got uh, uh, bad in the hospital. But can you hear me now still? A little bit uh -huh. more? It's not clear. I can hear we you. Can hear you very, very clearly. You can hear me or it's not. Cannot. Uh oh, you cannot. Mm -mm. Oh. It's, it's not clear at all. Oh, it's not clear at all. To me. Oh, I was trying to see if I can. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and I was in my office, but. Uh, I'm somewhere in the hospital and the reception is really bad. I don't know why it's bad today. It is also <laughs> possible that the batteries, your AP's battery might be uh, low. Uh, you know what? Let me, let me get, let me get, let me pull my batteries out. Let me see. Yeah. Probably. You know, with me. <laughs> All right. Is it better now? Are you guys here? Yes. It's much better? It's, it's better. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So, um, so I was saying the 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 macrovascular complications that which people individuals get um, strokes, uh, they get heart attacks, and of course the kidney fails. And for individuals who um, are diabetic, they can have a cut in the leg. I won't even know they have a cut because uh, the nerves have already been compromised, so they can they don't feel when there's a cut. So, and that's why individuals who are diabetic, we tend to have them when they go see their doctor, the doctor will have to examine their feet and make sure it's fine. And from time to time, you have to examine your feet as well. Now, um, doctor, if you, uh, if I, do have house, a, I do uh, have a question, doctor. Well, I'll, I'll take your questions. So, okay. soon as, so, um, so if you're in the house, or you're walking, you need to put on slippers so that, you know, you don't, uh, God forbid there's a piece of uh, sharp nail on the, on, on the ground or a piece of uh, brass or whatever you can cut, you may not even know. Um, now, the, the auto, autonomic complications of diabetes, meaning there's, a, there's, a, there's another kind of nervous system that we have, uh, the one that controls your heartbeats, meaning you're sitting down right now comfortably, you breathe by yourself, nobody's telling you how to breathe. Your heart is beating by itself, nobody's telling you. Every all kind of system is working. There are two components that regulate those things, and that's the way God has set it up and set it up like that. So those regulated mechanisms, uh, the opposite, uh, and work together. There's a, the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system, the diabetes itself affects nerve to the point where people can have painless myocardial infection. So they have a heart attack, they don't even know they're having a heart attack because 
the pain in the heart. And some people are gastroparesis. And the food just goes down, it rushes through the stove, and it comes right back on the, on the end of So this of gastroparesis is what they call intestine. Um, you know, they're breaking up really bad. So oh, I suggest my. that we go to questions. And, you know, okay. that way, okay. you, I think, you know, people are commenting that it may be your bandwidth. No, no, I think bandwidth. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But, you know, we have, we have a sister, Sister Cordelia uh, Edebiri from Canada. She joined in from Canada and said that your audio is fine. So I um, think the problem is the United yeah. States people. <laughs> Canadians are fine. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> because I mean I, I from here I think uh, from my end I can see myself there's no breakage, there's nothing. So I don't know what it is. So <laughs> but anyway, we can take questions now if there's anybody who you know wants to take questions and then you know we'll take it from there. Well, I'll throw you my first my the first question. You mentioned something about, you know, type one diabetes being, you know, the, the lack of insulin in the body, the pancreas has failed, so no insulin. Then you said type two diabetes, uh, the insulin is there, but it's not getting to where it needs to do its job um, right. to metabolize the, the sugar. Then you said there's type one and a half diabetes. Can you tell us more about that? Can you say something, you know, enlighten us on what type one and a half is? Yeah, like I said, the type one and a half is in between the one and the two. So it begins first like a type two, meaning there's increased, the pancreas is producing insulin, but it's just not going into the system, meaning there's increased resistance. And that resistance is produced by antibodies that for some reason the body is producing. And those antibodies that block, that increase the resistance of the insulin going to the body uh, creates an atmosphere where uh, you begin to slowly, your sugar goes up and goes up and goes up slowly. Now I'll give you a typical example that happened very recently within uh, a year. I have this gentleman, he's 34 years old, uh, big guy, good looking, you know, exercise daily every day. 2019, I checked his A1C, which is the parameter for uh, uh, measuring diabetes. Now I checked, it was 5.1. Ideally, your A1C should be between 5.7 to 6.5, and that's uh, pre-diabetes. But less than 5.7, meaning you're cleared, you're good. 5.7 or less, you're good. 5.7 to 6.5, you're pre-diabetic. Now, 6.5 and above, which symptoms? or if it has gone to seven with symptoms, then you're diabetic, irrespective. So I checked, he's almost 5.1. So in 2020, I checked again, it was 5.3. Now, 2021, I checked, it was 6.5. So I'm like, hmm, you become pre-diabetic. So I said, okay, in three months, I check again. Before three months, he became diabetic straight up. He ended up in the hospital. So, and then, <laughs> Uh, so these are the things that happen. And this things can rapidly come on and come so quickly. And eventually he told me like, yeah, in my family, it happens. People want to get to age 40, this is what happens. So sometimes there's a predisposed genetic modification that takes place. And that's why the term called epigenetics, where these, the food that we eat, the environment that we live in, uh, the altitude where we live, the kind of food you eat and all that can affect how your DNA is expressed. It doesn't change the DNA itself. It just changes the way the expression of the DNA, meaning the, 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 the DNA that codes for insulin production or ins insulin absorption in the body can become defective, like in the case of the type one and a half. So those individuals begin like that, there's increased resistance, but over time, as those antibodies accumulate, they begin to destroy the pancreas itself. They destroy it to the point where the pancreas now fail. So they begin like type two, where they type, go and start with medication, they take the medication, you increase the dose, you increase the dose to the point where you now have to add insulin. 
and then eventually they're strictly on insulin. So if they begin like type two, they end up as type one. That's why it's called type one and a half. And that's the word they call the LADA, little autoimmune diabetes of the adult. You are mute, doctor. I'm you muted. Are... Thank you. Thank you so much. I was okay. saying most people have not heard of the type um, 1.5 diabetes. So thank you okay. so much for that explanation. Uh, I have a question here. And if you have questions, please post them. Or if you want to ask them yourself, which is better, raise your hand and you'll be called upon to, to ask your question. This question, Dr. Aliya says, what is the relationship between imported food products coming from the US to Africa. And I think the question was asked because you know you expatiated on the fact that we didn't have diabetes in Africa like we have the epidemic now. Right. So it, it, I mean, if you look here in the United States uh, and that's why I've been sending the alarm, especially for people back home, because we want, we don't have the capacity, neither we have the means to manage diabetes and all its attendant complications. We really don't in Africa. So here, I'll give you how bad it is. Every day in this country, four people get their legs amputated, four. That's how bad. Now here, especially for those of us who have African descent, we constitute about 12 to 13, 15%, they say, of the total population here in the United States. But for those who end up on dialysis, because the number one cause of, of kidney failure in the world is diabetes. The number two is high blood pressure. So you know high blood pressure and diabetes go together. So if you have that, I call it a double whammy. So in this country, we constitute, I mean the black, 50% maximum of the population. But guess what? We constitute 34% of those of us are on dialysis. And that's absurd. The number of people who end up with strokes in this country. Cardiovascular disease was the number one cause of death consistently in this country. Last year, it was 639 million people. Even in the COVID period, 639. COVID was only number three cause of death in this country. I know people died, but it was the third leading cause of death. Coronary disease was number one. Cancers, of course, was number two. And then COVID came up and took over to number three. So this is how bad. Now, why am I saying this? Because those of us back home, like I said, we don't have the capacity. We don't have, you know, the, the means. And I think it is new to our DNA. So we don't understand the signs and symptoms. We don't understand, you know, uh, the things that how it needs to go. Now, we talk about important food. It's not just important food alone. I'll give you a typical example. Back in the day, if you want to go see grandma, what do you do? You walk up to grandma, you walk to grandma's house, you knock on grandma's house, you go see your friends. What do you do now? You pick up the phone, hi grandma, how are you? Nobody walks anymore. That's one. Two, how many of the kids go out to play anymore? They don't play like that. We all run and play soccer, football. Now with security issues that are going on, with the Western kind of living where people live in, oh, I live, me and my family, you know, the nucleus family, all of those is changing our dynamics, where we come from, to the point where people don't have outdoor activities anymore. So people have their kids locked up in the house and all that. So that's two. Now, of course, um, if you don't go out, most people sit at home now. Back in the day, it was just one TV. And, and if that is what you knew, everybody goes outside to play, <laughs> play. Nobody stays in the house. Now everybody's in the house. Everybody have an iPad. Everybody have multiple phones to, to read. So nobody goes out. So the vitamin D that I talked about that down regulates the inflammatory process that takes place to cause diabetes, we're losing it. And that's why if you look at Nigeria, even way back then, the number of people who had diabetes, uh, people who had heart attacks and all that, were people who are affluent, who live from air conditioned room to air conditioned house to air conditioned office to air conditioned car, those are the people because they live in, even if they live in Nigeria, they began to, the, 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 the living lifestyle is like they live in a temperate world. So of course, you're going to get temperate world disease. So these are the issues that are coming up. So it's not just stuff. Now, now add the food on top of it. When I was growing up, Lord have mercy, we didn't have pizzas to eat back home. We never had that. Now they have pizza. 
Now they have Indomie. We ate yam, we ate all those sausages. See, these are issues that are taking place. And now let me give you a particular study that was done about 15 years ago, where they took two sets of people, 10 of them, one set from Africa and another set from the Western world, from the US, and did an EGD, endoscopy, put a camera down the stomach and looked in and took a biopsy of the stomach. When they did that from the African and from Western um, African American, the blacks who were here. Now they looked at the, the stomach um, track. The stomach track of the villa, the stomach you know, lining was very healthy of the African, you know, because the kind of food they ate and all that. And when they looked at those of the people here in the Western world, it was a little more flat. So what did they do? They, they switched their diet. Those who were African started eating Western diet and those who were African-American started eating African diet. Six months, only six months alone, they checked again. There's a reverse. So it therefore tells you that the food that we eat makes a whole lot of difference. And that's why when they used to say, you are what you eat, it's a fact. This is not a lie. We are what we eat. So we need to be careful. So in as much as we, you know, watch what we eat and, and, and eat more natural and more, you know, um, um, organic materials, we also need to be active. We need to, you know, go out and need to get the vitamin D, especially those of us who are African descent. Look, we used to be taught erroneously that, you go outside, early morning sun, that's what you get in vitamin D. That was so wrong, we were taught by the British. Because you know what? We need a higher amount of sun, an intensity of sun, because the color of our skin was darker as compared to a Caucasian. So these are some of the things we begin to understand where we are now really writing our own books so that we can tell our own story as it pertains to our own health. Because everything we read all through was not done by us. It's different. So these are the things why we have to become advocates. And I hope you, Dr. O, and us, and every other doctor who's here, have to take charge and lead this mantle so that we can help teach our people and give them a healthy life and healthy lifestyle. Dr. O, you're I muted. Again, <laughs> thank you so much. And Dr. Aluya. You are doing it. Saturday, you were with a panel of uh, 11 other uh, physicians educating us, you know, in the, in the attempt to help us understand how we need to live healthier lives. That's one of the reasons we are doing, that's really the main reason we are together right now again, every Monday to learn more. We have to do more. Um, I have more questions on, actually not quite questions, but comments on the fact that diet, as you have said, and exercise, you know, impacts diabetes uh, positively if the diet is good. But I have comments here pointing us to the fact that even the water being consumed that we consumed is no longer just water. This is uh, Mr. William Craig. He, you know, he's, he's really on the roll on this, that they have added Epsom salt to our available water. He also commented that it was realized some years ago, you know, about diabetes uh, type one. I think that was when you were talking that it was called um, flat bush diabetes, you know, in the, in the, Community of Caribbean and those of African heritage. Yeah. But he said something right. again about food that the much of the US catastrophic diabetes is environmental. That is adding things to the food being consumed by people of color. And he said HFCS prevents safety. High fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup. If Dr. Ajagbe is on this, on this forum, he will be clapping. Yes, he is. That actually way started way late in the late 70s. And uh, in, the, in the process of wanting to preserve food and give it a longer shelf life. So they added all of those. And then, of course, 10, 20 years later, we've seen the effect. 
So a lot of the medical outcome of decisions that carried out on a political or policy level, uh, sometimes we get the effect 20, 30, 40 years after. If we don't have people who are watching out, then we'll be lost. We'll begin to grapple with find solutions to them. Your point, doctor, about the need to educate. We need to tell our own story. You, 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 you said that. That is critical. We need to bring that into the community right now because there are young people between the ages of 14 and 20 who I am seeing with type 2 diabetes. I should never see that at all. Uh, that is strictly environmental at this point in time. And uh, there are studies done about the high fructose corn syrup in terms of it uh, uh, stopping, uh, uh, stopping the body from reaching satiety. If you don't reach satiety, uh, uh, you just keep on eating. Insulin's never released and, and it goes on and on and on to the point where you burn out the pancreas uh, or the islets in terms of the pancreas as, as that. Uh, you mentioned something else about historical things, which I think is uh, wonderful that you brought it up. But, uh, and as you said, justly, uh, uh, mankind started in Africa, correct? That's what you said. Correct. And uh, yeah. uh, the, the white man or the man, the other man moved out of Africa because of their albinoism. They could not stand the, the sun. So they went north. And at the same time, you had people go east. So you had the Asian and or the Mongoloid that was created. You had the Northern right. uh, uh, created. And now you have uh, uh, us created. So basically, historically, it is an extraordinary story. And maybe you're the one to bring it forward and just tell it at this point. Yes, uh, we, I, I would actually write uh, a book uh, with a gentleman uh, with him uh michael Babby, uh who's done some stuff is actually doing a, a little documentary right now i uh, call him uh living black in america hear my voice so if you google that up you're going to see that and uh we're going to put up something when it comes to health uh and anthropology and how health has defined who we are and what we need to look into the future where we're going from here uh, and so important that we understand that of course they do you mentioned also about melanin in terms of its value and its effect. Uh, many of the uh, people of color here in this country, we are, we are vitamin D deficient. So what are we doing now? We are supporting the, uh, uh, the uh, big pharma in terms of taking a, a, a D3. And in some cases we even have to take D2, uh, which is uh, an Rx entity. Uh, you know probably very well that many of the individuals on dialysis are now taking uh, 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 vitamin D, uh, uh, D2, to aid and abet the calcium, which tends to then collapse in certain ways. So. Right, right, right. So, I, I mean, um, at this stage, we have no choice because if you tell, I mean, I tell a lot of my brothers and sisters, black brothers, look, you need to come out of the song. No, hell no. I don't want to be in the sun. I don't know. I don't like the sun because it make me darker. Like, jeez. <laughs> well, in fairness and in defense of um, our brothers and sisters who don't want to stay in the sun, we do have melanin. And okay. melanin naturally shields us from the sun. That is why our beautiful colors shields us and protects us from cancer as opposed to our Caucasian counterparts. Right. So if you, if you lay in the sun as a, as a person of color like me, you will still not absorb vitamin D the way you should or you could well, because that's of why the I said, of right. It, right, if you hear what I said earlier, uh, the British taught us that early morning sun is what we need. And that was so bad. It was so erroneous because that's what they need in the early morning sun. We need midday sun between 12 to 3 o'clock, period. <laughs> but because we know that now, that's what we're teaching. And that's why if you look around, I mean, how many people who are they who, who work, you know, till the, 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 the go out to work or hustle for job every day in Lagos, in Abuja, everywhere. How many of them you see with diabetes? You don't see them have diabetes, you really don't. 
you know, and they're working, they're out there, you know, activities going on and all that. And because of that, you don't. But you see more among those one who live like they live in temporary regions, um, who eat the kind of food that they eat in temporary regions. So it's a blunting again, the GI tract. So it's a, it's a whole combination. The GI tract is blunted. They have no vitamin D. They, they have sedentary lifestyle. So combination of all those three, voila, what do you get? <laughs> all the big troubles that, that come with it, you know? <laughs> and the Lord help us. We have a lot going on in our societies and it always bulges down to diet and exercise. Right. Incredible. Um, we need to do a lot more about diet. And so guess Thank what? You. Next week, we are bringing in an amazing nutritionist, <laughs> Mr. William Craig. <laughs> we him a little bit tonight already. So stay tuned next week. I can't wait because we really need to know. We've been on this forum. We've talked a lot about, okay, we know diet, diet. We need to change diet. We need to exercise. Exactly what in our diet? Exactly what do we need to add? Exactly what do we need to remove? And these are the things that um, hopefully we'll learn next week. Um, he's amazingly, amazingly, you know, gifted. He comes with uh, years of experience. And I am so excited that um, next week we'll be enjoying um, real, real in-depth information in how to really live right and avert, you know, these things like diabetes, high blood pressure, and those cardiovascular um, issues. So questions, does anyone else have any more questions? Raise your hand or forever hold your peace. <laughs> well, well, I'm I want to ask one question. Yes. Thank please. you, Dr. Leah, good presentation. This question, we may have answer or answers, but I still want to bring it out so we see how we can help ourselves and help our young generation to, if you call it, avoid this pandemic or this epidemic. We live in a society and a situation where we're talking about enjoying the sunlight midday, but we also want to remind ourselves that there is other or there are other few issues when young people of color are out there by themselves doing and minding their own business they've been suspected <laughs> i'm sorry to say it raw as it is but that is what it has been we are praying that this would turn a different or will take a different turn for the good and for the better of all of us but here we are, I believe, and everybody would, have, would tell me, I mean, will, conf, will, will agree with me that back in Africa, we don't have problem allowing our kids to have fun any day, any time, anywhere, and they will still come back safe and no problem. But we don't have that situation, so to say, here. Vis-a-vis, -vis, we are also busy working, chasing the dollars to make sure we pay our bills. So we have a cluster of things that we are looking at. But my, my point that I want to bring out that we would we all look at it together is how do we help our younger folks? I mean, I know recently it's seen to say it has been on the other side where the Asians now cannot go out for a walk by themselves. The older ones, for instance, they have to be accompanied because if they are not, something else is going to happen to them. So we're living in the prevalent uh, evil society. But I just want to bring it out so we see what we can do to help our, ourselves and help our young ones. Thank you. All right. You, know, uh, you, could, you could have asked a better person that question than Dr. Aluya. Well, <laughs> <laughs> right. no, I'll tell you this, um, and I'll take it from both ends. And I did allude that to it, everyone, when I talked about that things are not the way it used to be in, in Africa anymore. Uh, our Western lifestyle is taking over, not just that, but the security system back home is not as what it used to be. 
when we grew up, we could walk around and play and I mean, two, three streets away, you do that. But now it's not like that. I mean, for instance, in Nigeria, there's kidnapping, there's Boko Haram, there's all those things that you hear. So nobody wants to let their kids roam around anymore. You know, so it's hard. Uh, and then we begin to live in gated communities now as well. Uh, those gated communities where you only live at a certain place and certain areas or certain, you know, areas. And, and, and people begin to live in some um, defined communal settings uh, that's different. Uh, back in the days, you find out that sometimes the rich man's kids who play with the poor man's kids. Now, this is not the same. I mean, there's so much class structure that's plaguing the country. Um, First of all, Nigeria, even in Ghana, I was in Ghana. And one of the biggest issues we begin to see, which is very disturbing. And I say this, that God forbid that our generation will see our kids die in front of us. Mm. Because it has happened here in the United States. It's happened. When you see mothers who see their children die here, their children die before them, heart attack, end up on kidney failure, strokes. God forbid it happens because it's happening. I've seen that because again, Back in Africa, the obesity rate is on the up, upswing. It's on the rise. Our people, the fat kind of food, Indomie and all those things. Because, you see, there were times where I worked, mothers stayed at home and they took care of the children. And a group of mothers will watch the kids at the play and all that. It's not like that anymore. Mothers are working. Everybody's hustling. You need to pay for higher school fees. You need to buy more computers. You need to buy more games. You need to satisfy the urges of the kids. So who's watching? The nanny. If they, for those who have nanny, those are the watching. And what do you think the nanny will feed the kids? Whatever they feel like. And whatever the kids will want to eat. I want Indomie. I have kids who eat Indomie three times a day because that's what they want. That's feeding into the brain. So these are issues that are happening. And we see kids have become so obese. And, the studies have shown, I mean, I'm a pediatrician, I saw and I've seen it. If you're obese at age 10, you most will become obese for the rest of your life. If something drastic is not done about it. So that's what's happening. So the the the, the paradise we thought that we lived in back home, it's not what it used to be anymore. Now, if you come here, look at our environment. I mean, the systemic racism and Jim Crow laws created an atmosphere where people were put in almost like concentration camps within the United States, right? I mean, look at the ghettos, um, look at the houses that were built. They were structured like that. So that's why it was unsafe when you put the whole people together within the area. So it's unsafe. Now that's where this issue of, oh, you can't let your kids go out. You can't let it, that's where it all came from. You know, the project system, you know, but as, as African-Americans begin to uh, climb up the social structure, um, uh, economic ladder, where they now have to buy their homes before they went about how to buy homes, but now buy homes with backyards and all that, you see the kids are coming to play outside. But before all of that, we had obesity rampant, and they attended obesity for 10, 20, 40, 50 years. We've seen the effect. And this is what we're seeing right now. So... But then, guess what? Those of the other side, applications, what do they do? They are the ones who bask in the sun. They have a risk of getting melanin, cancer, uh, uh, multiple myeloma, and all the other, you know, uh, uh, melanin related, related cancer. But the ones who are coming out, and what do they do? They take their kids to the park. They go enjoy. They, they do all this. But guess what? In our area, how many parks do we have in our in our community? We don't have that much parks. And even if they have parks, they're so far away to the point where how many of our mothers and single mothers for that matter can be able to take their kids and walk down the street or walk to the nearest park? It's far off. So, and how many game systems do we have? So one of the things we can also do in our environment is one, encourage our children to get into sports. I mean, they're supervised, but then it's hard in the sense that it becomes tasking. Who's going to take the child to the game? Who's going to watch the house? Who's going to go fetch for food? Who's going to, you know, pay the bills? So these are big social economic things that really begin to plague us in our community. It's so difficult. But look, that's why we talk about having the number of children you can handle. 
And we see what's happening in our environment. Teen pregnancies, mm. 16, 17, 18, they have babies already. What does a 16, 17 year old know? Mm. And how would they, you can teach a child what you don't know. So mm. these are issues. And by the time she comes to, of course, the first guy who got pregnant is never there. I mean, 98% of the time, he will not end up with that young man who is also 16 or 15 in the first place. By the time she's 18, 19, she has another child. By the time she's 20, 21, she has another child. Three men for three children. And these are the things that we see. So again, those are dynamics that are taking place that we have to address as well. And out of this come the eating habits. What's a 16, 15 year old who never learned how to cook in their home? What do you think is going to fit the kids? Is yeah. they think that's going to make? So, of course, the kids will end up becoming obese and they end up becoming what? Diabetic with complications and dying in front of their mothers. So these are issues, both front and back home, and the issues that we're having here. So, yes, we need more advocates. And like I always say, the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. And that's why, Dr. O, when you saw what we did the other day, those young men were trying to encourage young black men to come into medicine. Because another 20 years, within the last 10 years, there's been a 20% drastic drop in the number of young black men who was going to medicine. And that's big. Because in another 20 years, you're going to see very, very few black men who will be doctors. And we know that statistics have shown that you're most likely to survive or do well health-wise if you're taken care of by individuals who look like you. I mean, that study went back to a point even in the neonatology. Those babies who were born in the ICU, the neonate, studies have shown they do better when they're taken care of by individuals who are of the same race with them. So if, I, if it starts at that level, you can translate it all the way up to adulthood. So we have a huge issue. We have a huge problem. So what I was saying, everybody need to raise their hand up, roll out their sleeves and work and become advocate. And that's why just like in the time of civil rights, where the church was involved, the clergy, the church and the clergy must be involved again this time around. And we must have to engage them. I've done that in my in my point of view. As a matter of fact, you know, this is a little segue. Where in September last year, I called. I was the president of New Jersey Medical Association as well as uh, um, AMPA, the Physician Association. I called on my hospital and those who were working on the COVID vaccine, and the CEO, and then called the clergy, the imams, the, the pastors, everybody. I said, "Look, this vaccine is going to come." We don't know when it's going to come. They say it might come in December, January. Let them come tell us in our environment, in our community, who are the people who are in that study? Because at that point in time, why did I do it? I did it because nationally, they had said only 10% of blacks were in the studies for the vaccine. So I said, let us see what's happening in our environment. Let's see if it's truly what is happening. And we come and, and said, look, when the vaccine comes, they will be forced to take it as well. So let them come tell us who went the study, how they got the people who were recruited in the study, and what were the side effects from the study from the COVID vaccine. And it was on the Moderna. And one of them was actually in Nigeria who was working. So we had this great talk. It was on Thursday evening. So that's what we have to take leadership, what we do to advocate for our, com our community. Because I'll tell you why. All the statistics I told you earlier on, the number of death and all that and all that, do you know that most of the medications that we swallow as black people, a lot of those studies, we maximum have been one to 2% in those studies. So how the heck do we know that those tablets really work for us? How do we know that? Because our numbers have not truly been well represented in any of those studies. So these are issues where we need more people, we need, and I tell you this, look, this is the time where you must take leadership in your individual space and find innovative ways to answering questions that come out of them. So if you're an engineer, take leadership in that space, find 
innovative ways where you can answer medical issues or other issues that come out of your spirit. If you're an artist, do the same. Advocate. This is what we're talking about. <laughs> Great. <Wow>. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, Dr. Ajay, thank you so much for that question. And uh, Dr. Aluya, wow. Thank you so much because, you know, I said it. There's no better person to ask that question than you. Starting from the foundation, the people who chose to destroy the black race, you know, thought it through well, because if you destroy the home, you will destroy a race. So if you have, you know, 16 year olds, 14 year olds having children, no father in the house, there's no structure, no, 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 I mean, then where do you go from there? We have our work cut out for us. I believe everybody on this forum is a leader. And you know what? We can start making changes in just our environment, make a ripple and let that ripple then ripple. Let that ripple ripple. And that's how we can get, we can get, you know, a uh, population, a society, our people better again. You know, uh, Dr. Aluya, you alluded to research. So true. In medicine, anyone in medicine knows that. It's only in recent times that we found out the blood pressure medication that works better for black people. And why did black people even enroll in such researches? Because of you and I. Because they see faces like us that look like them and we encourage them to participate because they've been burnt before. We all know about syphilis and we know what happened there. So for the first time in how many generations that medications have been used in people of our color, just like we are Caucasians, that we now found out that calcium channel blockers and diuretics are what works the best for people of our color. Um, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you this. I've, I've often um, described the reason why um, diuretics work better for us. Uh, and there's anthropological reasons to it. I'll give you a typical example. One, um, I think there are a few people in the watching room. So, um, hold on, sorry. So, um, you see, when we grew up, we were substantial farmers. And that's, you know, gathering. All humanity were, all through. I mean, forget what is happening now and all that. We were all farmers, you know, gatherers, hunters and all that. So in the tropics, when you're out there in the tropics, what do you do? You're out in the sun and the sun is right there with all the UV light, the UVA, UVB eating on you. So for the body, the way it's structured, we need to find a reason to do what? To preserve the fluid in you so that you don't get dehydrated. So in the process, it retains the salt. So in the process of retaining salt so that you can retain the water so you don't get dehydrated. So, and that's how we've lived for 60, 1,000 years, 50,000 years, a million years since we grew up to become who we are. Now, look at this, all of a sudden, you have those same people taken over 500 years ago and brought here. The genetics didn't change. But what changed is the environment. Now, what happened? Do they still require to preserve and retain salt anymore? No, they don't, because they, there's no need for it. So if the body continues to retain salt like it used to be, then of course the pressure will go up because they're also retaining salt and it's also retaining water. So that's why. So down the road, as they begin to give us salt losing blood pressure pills, we tend to do better with that. But I, 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 in this stage and age, and I always advocate, it's fine. You can do that for younger people. But for our older women, we tend to do worse because for some reason, uric acid forms and other complications uh, tend to fall. Because then at the point of where there's a reverse, they lose more salt. So if you are 65 and above, you be very careful putting them on, 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 um, on diuretics. Uh, but instead, knowing the privilege 
prevalence of diabetes, 66% in the clinic that come to see us. I've looked at it in my hospital and the teaching hospital where I work. 66% of people who come to see you on a daily basis have diabetes. So one of the things to do is to protect their kidneys. So you, you start with putting them on medications that will protect their kidneys. So if you uh, have diabetes, please, the things you need to watch out for. And I always tell people, it's even more than your, their money in your bank account. Because COVID has shown us that if you do not have a healthy, good health, everything else stops. The world stopped when COVID came out. So when you go see your doctor, before you go, get prepared. The information you need to ask, if you have, write that down. Because people tend to forget when they go see their doctor. They forget the things they're supposed to ask. So when you go prepared, like I always say, dress nicely, like you're going to church <laughs> to see a doctor, because then they'll respect you as well. You know, get prepared, get compo compo uh, comported, write down your questions, and then ask the questions. It's easier that when they ask and itemize them, and the doctor will answer them. Now, there are certain things you need to know as a doctor. One, as a patient, because you are your greatest advocate. And I understand my patient, look, you're with me maximum 30 minutes in two to three months, or sometimes in six months or even a year. But you're with yourself 247 all through the year. So who better knows the person than you? Nobody else. So if you come, questions you need to ask after, what is your blood pressure? That's one. Is it controlled? Is it normal? Two, and you need to know what the normal blood pressure is. At this stage, you can look up everything, Google it up. Uh, ask your doctor, doc, what is my A1C? And know those numbers. It has to be less than seven if you are diabetic, because studies have shown that if it's seven and above, you tend to have more problems. You need to know if it's less than seven. That's one, two. Doc, do I have protein in my urine? Or do I have those tiny, tiny, small, small proteins? If you don't remember what microalbumin is, because before the kidney begins to fail, it begins to suffer. And that suffer, that very, very early age, even before protein comes in the urine, is what you get microalbumin. So you can ask my dog, do I have those tiny proteins in my urine? Those tiny ones we can't see. Ask them. If they are, then we need to put you on medications that will protect your kidneys. So those are the things that are so important. Those are the questions you need to ask when you go see your doctor. Thank you. Dr. Aluya, um, there are so many comments here. Somebody said, great presentation, Dr. Aluya. Thank you for your highly informative presentation. Great one, thank you. Somebody mentioned leadership when you were challenging us to, <laughs> to lead. Thanks so much, amazing. Um, great answer, highly informative session and awesome. People are grateful. We are all grateful. Thank you. But I have a question that is thrown to me. It's, you know, direct message says, number one reason why Black men enter in chronic renal failure is because of hypertension, along with her cause of, you know, poor diet. Combine that with non-compliance with medications. I mean, you get all the disaster possible. I agree. <laughs> Do you agree, Dr. Aluya? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I agree. Uh, there's a reason for it. For everything on earth, there's always a reason. It's just that sometimes we may not find out the reason there or know the reason. And I'll give you a quick why. Look, if you have two kids, a boy and a girl, um, the girl, by the time the child begins to approach adolescence, what's the discussion that's given to that girl? The mother begins to teach the girl what? How to get ready, check her body, prepare for what? For a menstrual period. At age eight, nine, 10, 20, 15, do they have the same, do they have the same discussion with the boy? No, nobody does. Who, get, who, have, who sits down and discuss health issues with the boy? The first time most boys outside of the pediatric age have access or get to see the doctor Israelis sometimes when they're going to college or getting a job. That's the first time from, from age nine and 10, that's it. But you find out that the girl, from time to time, you have to do, if the, if the period is too much, you go see your doctor. If it's not coming, you go see your doctor. If it's late, 
see it up. If it's too much, see it up. So that really, those early things. And that's why the Bible said, teach your child in the way it should go. And do not depart from it. So parents usually teach those children. And they teach the girls very early enough. So that's why it's easy for them to um, accept healthcare, uh, seek healthcare when something goes wrong. Because the girl is taught, like, listen, if something goes wrong with your period, you may not have a child. So, of course, she will go seek anything that goes wrong. I'll ask questions. So these are issues that make it possible for most of the women to seek uh, healthcare early and first enough. And then forget the issue of the bravado is in, uh, especially black men have. I'm strong, there's nothing wrong with me, I'm good. Because now community culturally will be told that you need to be strong, you need to. So if you are sick, meaning you're weak, that's the way culturally we've been invited. But it's no longer like that. So we always tell people this, and I tell people this, look, everybody who's listening to me right now, please seek your doctor, get a primary care doctor and get a good one and preferably somebody who looks like you and who's not just looking like you but smart enough to, to attend to you at the same time. But some of us were, were terrible on our own as well. But outside of that, um, always ask. You have to do what your A1C status is. Everybody needs to know what their A1C status is, their diabetes status. And that's what I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. At this point, we come to a Medical Monday's moment. The person who brings 10 or more people to the um, platform um, is a VIP and gets a gift. One who brings 20 or more is a champion and gets a gift. However, this week, I'm debating again, just because I've not received any emails from anyone to let me know how many people they invited and actually showed up last week. So there's somebody on this forum who I'm hoping that one day, because spirituality is part of our, um, our health, that maybe one day we'll be able to know how to weave this into Medical Mondays. We have someone on this platform who has never missed a day of Medical Mondays. A giant in the Lord. And we are going to give today's gift to him, Dr. Reverend Ezekiel Ogundipe. We welcome you, sir. You've always been here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Today, we are giving you an Amazon gift card. Oh. <laughs> for always participating from March 1st when this program started. So, wow. thank you very much, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Do a bless. Go ahead, sir. I said, you are blessed. Amen. God bless everyone on the forum in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, sir. God bless you, sir. Thank you. So, that being said, we have had, I mean, Dr. Aluya, who is really an all-rounder. And before I conclude, I saw that uh, Mr. William Craig Stay tuned to hear him next week. Said, unfortunately, we live in a paternalistic society. Much to say about the social, political, racial system. There is indeed much to say. I am so excited about the way Medical Mondays today went. Um, this is what it's about. Nothing is written in stone. We've learned a lot that went even a little bit beyond medicine um, in the traditional sense, but went into our core and what we are enduring and how we, uh, where we need to go. Thank you so much for Dr. Aluya for being so diverse and being able to you know, handle all of the questions 
uh, that came to him. So at this point, I'm going to ask everybody to uh, please unmute and just give uh, Dr. Aluya uh, our thank you for the excellent Thank you. 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 Mm. Uh -uh. So, Dr. Aluya. Yeah, that's my president. <laughs> yes, Madam VP. Thank you, Ma. <laughs> I'm going to charge you. <laughs> and I'll pay, ma'am. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Aluya, if you please give us uh, a word of conclusion, we will appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for the honor. Thank you for the platform, uh, for giving the chance uh, to speak, uh, to speak to you know such great minds and, and noble people. Uh, and thank you for allowing me you know express myself and uh, most importantly uh, put forth my passion and, and the things that uh, are bothering us and plague us as a whole. Um, we no doubt live in very interesting times. And the interesting times, like the Chinese say, usually not a good time. Uh, it's times where there's a whole lot of uh, uh, dynamics, uh, socioeconomic and political playing uh, into the board that eventually uh, make who us who we are. And especially for those of us who have African descent, uh, like I said, the, the harvest is plenty, the workers are few, um, but each and every one of us will have to be champions, uh, where we take leadership of our individual spaces where we are and find innovative ways and answering problems that come out of those places. So if you are an engineer, if you are a lawyer, if you are an understanding that whatever affects you in Maryland or in Texas, in Canada, as a black person affects me in New Jersey. And as we stand, we represent each and every one of us wherever we go. And yes, this, is so. same message. <laughs> this is the same message we must bring down to our children as well, to the point where we make them understand that as they set forth out there, they're setting up for not just to represent themselves, their family or Africa, but the entire black race. Because when you walk down the street, what they see is black. They don't know if you're Jamaican, Nigerian or whatever. And that's where it starts from. So that we begin to have the voice uh, that we advocate for ourselves and put ourselves together. So but before I leave, I always say this, alone, we can go far, but together we can go further. And we can do this if we truly come together. And I say thank you and God bless you. Amen, amen. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. And with this, we'll conclude Medical Mondays for tonight. And remember, we have not established medical relationship, but we have done our best to share current medical information in order to better our health. Next week, we will hear from Mr. William Craig, who will tell us about nutrition. So please come with your pen and paper and let's learn what to put in our bodies so that we can prevent the evil and put in the good. Thank you. Have a blessed rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.